This month, October 2022, we're dropping a photo zine and interview with You Won't Red Eye Mob and a Patreon episode with Lex PMS. The You Won't Zine is all film photography, featuring AIDS, Too Much, Vane, Ruiner, Abyss, ASO, Bando, and more. The You Won't interview runs 12 pages long, featuring film photos not shown in the zine, as well as a brief history of REM crew. Both the zine and the interview are available via our Patreon and shipped to our Patreon members. The Lex PMS episode is also available on our Patreon. Lex speaks on what her upbringing was like being raised in the Bronx, selling all her belongings and moving abroad, her time spent in Australian jail and what the Australian system was like, her bail conditions, why she started writing graffiti, her artwork, photography, thoughts on life, and more. Members also gain access to our Patreon library with interviews from Lex PMS, Modus, Amuse, Dyke, Acer, Zers, Rebo, Bat, Ola, Sabe, Diego127, Dessa MTA, Wayne1, Dual Riss, Host18, Cash4, XSM, Sake, and less, as well as videos like All We Got Is Us 2, Savvy OTR, and more. Hey, this is Claw Money, and you're listening to Angel and Z, sponsored by Art Primo. What is Art Primo, you ask? How dare you? Art Primo is a graffiti shop that was started by writers for writers in Seattle in 2001, and they have stayed true to their roots for over 20 years. Offering everything from caps to inks to paint to refillable mops. They got nibs, they got jibs, they got caps, solid zines, books, and more. And their how-to videos and YouTube channel are legendary. Art Primo strives to keep their prices low and quality high, hand pouring all of their mops and inks in their Seattle warehouse. Shipping orders on the same day and their site is a source of information for all types of writing tools. Tools for what? Tools for the revolution. So yeah, you were probably the only writer we've had on that was a scientist in a past life. You were particularly doing stem cell research biology, which I find very uh, interesting for someone who's like, you know, writing graph, painting on freights and in a pretty like a, some well-known crews, painting with some well-known people as well uh, to have been doing that. So what was what exactly was it that you were doing in, in being a scientist? And also, uh, how did you even get into that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's so long ago now. It, it kind of feels like like a, yeah, a different life. Um, so I was going to San Francisco State and I ended up getting into the master's program there in the stem cell biology program. Um, and I ended up working at Children's Hospital of Oakland Research Institute in a doctor's lab who was a pediatric oncologist. So she was interested in the causes of cancer, or studying different types of cancer in kids. And she ended up doing research or running research rather than working as a doctor you know, directly with kids. Um, and my project specifically, I was working on studying factors that influence this thing called pluripotency, which is what helps stem cells maintain their stem cellness. So what's unique about stem cells is they're able to regenerate themselves. And then they can also go through a process called differentiation where they can change into any precursor cell. So it could be skeletal muscle neural tissue, et cetera. So I was interested in looking at factors that helped stem cells control them th themselves and then what influenced them to start the process of differentiation into those precursor uh, cell types. So I was studying a specific chemical that impacted pluripotency. Was this something that you kind of grew up actually wanting to do or was this something like a forced family situation what was the deal hmm. no I mean both my grandparents on my mom's side were scientists um, and my grandmother was a biologist so I guess I grew up seeing some of that from afar I remember going to visit my grandfather's lab in Manhattan like once or twice um, but actually how I got into science was I was just more into into exercise and health and I thought I wanted to do like sports medicine mm. and I started to take some classes with that and I 
it was pretty boring. So I decided to sort of like zoom out and focus on just biology in general. And I ended up looking at and studying physiology, which is the how organ systems work together. And then from there, I got into stem cell science. So, so for example, say that you're studying, you're like, you're studying, you're a stem cell researcher, you're doing research. What exactly of stem cells are you researching? Like we know that they can turn into essentially any cell. They're pretty yeah. thought to be useful for repair and healing and shit like that. So what are you researching? What questions were you trying to answer? Yes, that's a good question. Yeah. So the, why, I guess the main thing, why, or one of the main aspects of humans interest in stem cells as far as it being a cell a cell based science or, or a cell based therapy is we want to have the ability to um, put stem cells into someone's body when some part of their body doesn't work so say you have a tumor you need to remove a portion of the brain or you get into an accident you lose the ability to use your legs ideally you'd want to be able to put stem cells into um, your spinal cord you know above where the injury happened and have it regenerate that tissue and then you regain the capacity to to walk but in order to do that we need to know what factors influence stem cells and how they behave because if you just put a bunch of cells in someone's body this the body's like what are these and they attack it you know it's it's seen as and then, so usually if you were to do that with sort of no regard it would grow a tumor or you you definitely start some sort of event that would be very unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So you need to lead stem cells into the direction of where they're supposed to be. So when you put them put them in that local environment, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so how they do that is through these cell receptors that that face outward, and then they're essentially interacting with chemicals in the local environment. And they're and they're, they they don't know because they don't have consciousness, but they're presenting receptors that are appropriately responding to what's around them so for people listening to this and they don't know anything about stem cells let's say what are the origins of stem cells are they something man-made are they artificial or are they from a different organism like how does that work and like how do you extract them and like yeah. put them into something good question so stem cells are the first cells that come about when an organism is i guess growing so you have you know your precursors, you have your stem cells and then they start dividing and differentiating into brain tissue, skeletal muscle, things like that. Um, so to return back to your question, we want to be able to use stem cells for cell based therapy, but we need to know enough where we can introduce them into the local environment. And those stem cells aren't just like, aren't, um, they're not like what, what's they're not a master stem cell but they're sort of differentiated enough so that they're headed in the direction of what they're supposed to become if that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah so we need to know a lot about how that process happens yeah because you're legitimately like playing with the fabric of human yeah. things so you better know how that shit works or you're going to just inject it and they're going to get a crazy tumor yeah that's one of many outcomes that could happen yeah i mean you have to understand really well how to control that so when you place stem cells into the environment they behave appropriately mm. so when you got into science were you already into graph were you already painting graffiti um how deep into graph were you when you started to enter into this real deal uh academic world yeah i was i was deep into graffiti i started as a teenager um and i started focusing on science in my late mid mid to late 20s so i was already really into it um yeah i mean i i don't i didn't want to be a scientist when i was like three years old or anything like that i guess through just a set of circumstances and decisions that i made i ended up at that doorway mm -hmm. yeah. so were you like going to school for this and then mm -hmm. just straight up hitting the yard after yeah or yeah what yeah. kind of deal was it because you talk about uh graffiti kind of as a socially ostracizing thing where you kind of have to live this dual life because you don't want your professors knowing uh, that you're painting or for whatever, mm -hmm. that whatever they may think about it. So what was that? What was that process like? Yeah. I mean, I think at that time it felt like a struggle. It felt like I was headed down the path of, of needing to focus on a career based thing that had little to no overlap with the art pursuits that I was involved in. Um, but I was passionately involved and still am in graffiti and just 
you know, various art forms. Um, so they felt those two things felt at odds with one another. Um, and yeah, and I ended up sort of choosing what felt like what I needed to or what was more natural um, and going the route of focusing on art. Um, because, yeah, they they didn't seem to overlap enough where I could do both uh, in with, you know, to the degree that I wanted to. At that time, did your peer group, for example, in the institute, like in the college, did they know what you were doing? Did you come to class with, like paint on your fingers and they were like, mm, what's going on? Or? I don't think so. I think it kept it pretty separate. Um, but that was that was something at the time that felt like. I, you know, that the group of people that I spent the, the majority of the day with weren't going to relate to the pursuits that I had at night and vice versa. Um, yeah, that was probably one of the things that drew me away from it. Hmm. But I think my I think my lab director knew, like, if I had to travel for an art show or something, I wouldn't I wouldn't like make up a story about it. I'd just tell her. Yeah. So how long were you were you working full time as a scientist? Uh, while still writing graph and while still doing your pursuit of art on the on the side until you started realizing that one of them had to give mm, I worked for yeah maybe three years on science in you know in a lab until I decided to step away from that three years yeah uh, what was the what was the drawing line where you're like this is mm, I, I think I had a, a few different events um I, I, had, I had a situation in the lab happen where there were two, there were, so the lab was composed of a bunch of different scientists and some of them were visiting, um, were visiting scientists from other like hospitals or something like that. One of them was a surgeon. This other guy had been a, a, an adjunct professor at a university and was like working in our lab, waiting to get a better position at a different university. And they were doing something in the lab that they were like talking to these Indian postdocs that worked in our lab in their accents or mocking them. And it was driving me crazy because um, it just felt so unprofessional, you know, and it was driving me nuts and nuts. I didn't know what to do. And then I decided to sort of confront them about it. <clears throat> you confronted the scientists. Yeah, who were, they were basically like, not my bosses, but like, they were not my peers. They were way, these were guys in their 40s, well into their careers. And I ended up having this reaction with them, or I, or the way that I confronted them was like, just head on, like, this is totally unacceptable, it's so unprofessional, you're mocking these people that come from a different place for no reason, we're not going to have a discussion about it, it just needs to stop. And I felt like at the time I was doing the right thing. I mean, I felt like morally I was doing the right thing, but how I went about doing it was, was, uh, was pretty ineffective in that these dudes were not like, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You know, they felt super defensive and obviously embarrassed. And so what ended up happening was this weird rift occurred where the, just the vibe was all off afterward and my boss kept coming to me like what's going on did, did something happened blah 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 and I didn't want to snitch I didn't want to tell her oh yeah you know these guys are doing this thing so I just kind of kept it to myself but what it, what ended up happening was I sort of put that um uh resentment that I had towards them and how they had behaved into the whole situation I sort of, in a way, in hindsight, created a shittier situation for myself by rather than dealing with it in a way where she could handle something that was happening unprofessionally, I tried to take it on myself. And then the conflict that ensued ended up being one of the driving factors why I was like, you know what, like, I got to step away from this. Because it was so awkward and weird and um, uncomfortable to be the the youngest and least trained scientists in the lab and also feel like these people that were like you know much more sort of established in their careers were a little bit out to get me mm -hmm. that's what it felt like you know i think in hindsight i went about doing it the wrong way 
Um, yeah, so that's that's getting down into the weeds of one of the things that um, ended up being. So I think in a com- that ev- specific event, in combination with just having a lot of opportunities with art to travel, to participate in shows, um, it just I ended up just being like, okay, clearly this is what I need to pivot towards. Did so, you go ahead? No, I was just gonna say. So essentially, it wasn't let's say that much of a risk because you know we've talked to people on the show where they would have a stable job a stable career and then they would just like say fuck it all you know but they wouldn't really have a, a, something to fall back on in terms of financially so um you're saying like at that time art would kind of provide you with what you needed to get by without the science career right no i mean not really like i it was definitely still a struggle um and i made it work and i ended up first i was trying to sort of just do fine art and i and i ended up sort of marrying the skill set that I have from graffiti and painting and pivoting t- more towards mixing, doing my own stuff with doing commercial projects as well. So yeah, it took, it was like a learning curve of figuring out the balance of how to be an artist and to make ends meet mm-hmm. and, you know, be involved in things that were interesting and were a mix of my own interests and also, you know, taking on new challenges mm-hmm. by having other people say, Hey, do you, you know, are you interested in designing this thing for us or something like that? Mm-hmm. So now that, um, now that that shit's in the past, when you look back on it, what do you think? Mm. You're now working a very unconventional job. Uh, you know, like it's not like you have, or at least to my knowledge, like a nine to five with a structure, like the same way that maybe someone else does that most people do, honestly. Mm-hmm. So when you look back on it and, uh, it's kind of like one of the, it's like a, what you were doing wasn't like a in my opinion at least a regular job like you're a stem cell research biologist like that's pretty crazy so when you look back on it what goes through your mind Mm, i mean i appreciate the experience that i had sometimes i miss it i miss thinking critically about you know the the little nuances of of designing experiments around how to how to answer different questions um i think i probably would have ended up where i'm at anyways which is just working creatively as an artist um just because that's something i've always been passionate about and had i've stuck with Mm. and um yeah i i guess in retrospect i would have handled this specific situation differently um and i wouldn't have let a small what what seems like in the in this in the scheme of my life and the events that are going to dictate my life i wouldn't have let such a such a an event that didn't really have to do with me directly have such an impact on my own decisions around my involvement in science but you live and you learn you know you go through things and then they they yeah they affect you in different ways so who's to say what what I would do differently yeah I mean from my personal experience I realized that creative endeavors especially like painting graffiti at night um is rough with like a nine to five essentially like a yeah. career because like I still work a full-time job as a plumber yeah and um you know that only you only have so much gas in your gas tank mm-hmm. because if you go out and paint let's say all night and then you go to work right after like sure this the six spot will give you energy to get through the day that you painted but like that only lasts so long until like biology kicks in and you're like yo i need some sleep you know so yeah, you end yeah, up yeah. sacrificing one or the other and i have yet to sacrifice the other but you know so. <laughs> yeah 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 i mean i think it's hard to be to think critically when you're staying up all night and mm. to and to be sharp i mean i'm someone that um that tends to happen i'm like a, a night owl i'm not sure if that's because i train myself to be creative through over all the years of like working creatively in the dark or at night but that's when i tend my brain tends to like sort of wake up and get more get the juices going uh later in the day um yeah which which maybe doesn't work so well with uh with a science job which is more nine to five but i do i do sort of to answer your first question or statement about my current situation. I do work like a regular nine to five, if you will now, just painting commercial murals and, and doing a variety of design projects. Um, it just tends, it, you know, the client changes, the parameters of the projects change. Um, but I have a pretty regular schedule. And I have two kids, so I have to maintain some semblance of, of order and, and, uh, and schedule for them as well. 
do you hold any resentment towards the academic world or do you think about the fact also that I'm assuming to get to your position as a scientist, you had to go through some, you know, some shit. You had to go to school for that. You had mm. to work up to it only to leave it to essentially start painting no, or not start I mean, painting, but focus more on it. Yeah, I don't No, I don't have any resentment toward. I think I think science is a noble pursuit. Um, you know, any any. I think the basic premise of science is, is understanding the natural world for the betterment of humanity. And that's that's definitely a very noble cause. So I don't. Yeah. I, I don't put my own experience on on the whole. as a lens on the whole thing. Mm. Yeah. How did you initially start getting? How did you initially get into graffiti? Uh, you lived in Maine, right? Yeah, I grew up in Maine. I was born in Atlanta. I moved to Maine when I was three. Um, I don't even know. Like, I have such a bad memory. As a kid, I was interested in skating and just generally just probably breaking the rules and. Graffiti was definitely off the beaten path in Maine. It wasn't something that you'd see on the side of a building too often, at least at the time when I was, you know, in, in the late 80s and, and 90s, there wasn't any graffiti to be seen, so much so on the street. Um, and, uh, but yeah, just going to skate spots, um, th- those things tended to go hand in hand. You'd see graffiti or... I, f- I think I, s- I sought it out. I saw it in skate videos, and it just seemed cool to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I ended up going to high school. One of the kids that had moved to my town moved there from Slovakia, and um, and he wrote graffiti. And I remember being in a class and seeing him drawing in a black book and being like, whoa, what is that? You know. And um, he wrote past, and he was probably the first graffiti writer that kind of like put me onto stuff or showed me how to draw letters. And he would go, actually, when we'd first go paint, he would draw my name. I wrote Mest at the time. He would draw my name on the wall and help me sort of fill it in. Um, and then I ended up meeting some other writers. I just stuck with it and mm-hmm. stayed with it. Yeah. So in Maine, it was mostly uh, freight culture, right? It wasn't yeah. uh, like city spots and stuff like that. Yeah, it was mostly like freight culture and then some abandoned buildings like trackside stuff under bridges things like that you'd have to kind of seek it out um and another thing that i guess was interesting to me as a kid or 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 stoked my interest as a teenager um, my dad was pretty into railroad culture and had actually hopped freights in the 70s uh when he lived in atlanta before i was born um He's a writer and he was working as a journalist and he pitched a story to a monthly magazine to hop freights from Atlanta to Washington State and they went for it and then he ended up hopping freights with this photographer and writing a story about it and, um, you know, learning about freight culture. Um, he, yeah, I think he actually did some streaks as well. Um, uh, yeah. What year was that around? That's in the 70s, I think. Uh, he might have. Re- I I can't remember exactly when. I want to say seventy three. He did this story. Um. So when I was a teenager, when I was a kid, he, you know, he we would go by the train yard sometimes. He would point out things to me. Um, and yeah, I think I I was drawn to what was painted on the side of the boxcars as well. That's amazing. No, I was gonna say just that. At what point did you realize like you were gonna keep doing this? You know, because some people they just do it for a little bit, just to like scratch that itch, and then they kind of yeah. stop or fade away. But it seems like you've you know prolonged this for quite some time now. So yeah, yeah. No, I'll never learn. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I I didn't. I, there wasn't a moment where I realized, oh, I'm gonna do this forever. Um, but at this point, I don't know. I can't see myself stepping away from somehow having graffiti be a part of my life um you know yeah have you had any interactions with the law while painting freights yeah yeah i've had my fair share of of uh legal issues and court trouble and stuff and this didn't affect like the the job as a scientist no no it didn't no yeah i've yeah i was always able to like not have it impact that so in terms of, um, you know, growing up in Maine, how do you think that, 
because you said that the area that you're from, it wasn't too culturally diverse. How do you think that growing up in such an area uh, affected your state of mind and how you viewed the world? Mm. Mm. I don't know. Maine was a cool place to grow up. Um, it was beautiful. My parents moved there on purpose, I think, at the time, in, you know, in the 80s. I mean, everywhere in America in the 80s, the crime was high. Um, but at the time, living in Atlanta, there was a bunch of crime. Like, someone was murdered on my block. Next, actually, my next-door neighbor was, was murdered. Um, and so my parents were like... They tell this funny story where uh, they said, I came home from um, preschool... And, I, you know, I was little. I had a southern accent. And I said, I got to get my gun. And, uh, you know, they decided, like, all right, we got we to gotta switch it up. <laughs> um, so uh, my mom had a cousin living in Maine. And they went and visited and liked it and ended up relocating. What did you think of it when you got there? I mean, I don't know. I don't remember. You were super young. Three. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, I liked growing up there. Um, it was beautiful. You know, it's like I'm not a super winter person, so I ended up not staying there. But I feel like I met, you know, a real special group of people that ended up influencing my life in a huge way. Is Maine where you met the people who are in Wyoming who you paint mm-hmm. with and stuff? Yeah, yeah. So I met those guys in high school. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I don't know who, who knows what would happen in life but those guys had a huge positive impact on my involvement and interest in graffiti and sort of showing me how to do things the right way i it's weird now because my life i have like you know i have two kids i'm not i'm still watching what seeing what's happening painting graffiti but i definitely feel like i'm in a new chapter of my life where i'm balancing out being a dad first, mm. putting food on the table, yeah. making ends meet, and also pursuing my artistic stuff. So there feels like a, a big shift in sort of like um, just graffiti as a priority, mm. if you will. Mm. So what would you, what of, would you say your number one priority is now your family? Yeah, without a doubt. How do you think that uh, having kids has affected your life? Mm, in a very positive way. I mean, I have a four-year-old daughter and a seven-year-old son, and it's hard to, like, it's just for my friends that don't have kids or people that don't have kids, it's hard to describe what, how your life shifts once you have a, a kid because nothing comes, nothing that you need comes before that, um, what, you know, in terms of, like, the kids, the, your child's needs are always first and foremost um which is easy to say but like when you get down to the nitty-gritty down in the weeds of like how that plays out um everything about life sort of shifts which is really nice to put yourself in the back seat in a way and and put someone else first but have it become natural like not something like oh my god i gotta do this i mean don't get me wrong parenting is super hard but you know, making that decision and putting your kids first is just, it just what comes along with the territory. What what do you Um, feel is the hardest part about parenting? Man, being a parent is super hard. Um, and I'm a single parent, so it's difficult. Um, I, I mean, with two kids, it's really hard to meet both kids needs and even just give them the attention where you're down on their level and you're interacting with them in a way where they where you feel like you're connecting with them because there's always a second kid being like ah, give me I want more food or I don't know whatever it is you know so finding a way to connect with both kids um, is difficult and just navigating different ages you know mm-hmm. uh, my kids are pretty strong-willed. I feel like it's karma. I was, I was a hellion, so I, uh, I had it coming. Um, but yeah, trying to be patient, patient with totally irrational little three-foot, 
you know, creatures is pretty, it's pretty trying at times. How do you, um, how do you personally control, let's say the influence the world can have on them? You know, cause some can argue that the world is, let's say on fire mm. and not a, the best place to raise a child nowadays. Um, you know, especially like, let's say in Oakland, you know, cause like it's my first time here and it seems like kind of a rough place to grow up, to be honest. Um, it seems like every area you go to in one way or another, it has, um, some type of visible crime or poverty and uh like what do you think about that when it comes to raising your children mm, yeah i mean the move back to oakland is kind of new for me um so my kids being here a lot is also new for them um i've been traveling around and moving living in different places for a bunch of years um as far as like how the world impl- impacts your kid or your, your children um, I don't know. I feel, I think you just need to give it your best and, and, you know, as long as you know that you're, you're putting all your effort into what you're doing and trying to make good decisions, that's going to have the biggest impact on your, your kids, you know, thriving and, and ha- enjoying life and learning and, and, um, seeing the wonder of the world. Uh, so I try to do that. And then there's a lot of things that none of us can control about life. So I guess one of the nice things about parenting is learning what to stress about. Once you have kids, you're like, I don't have time to stress about all this stuff because I have no ability to impact change on this amount of things in the world and this other stuff immediately. These children take such a priority that, that your focus shifts and what you're, what you're able to sort of your, yeah, your bandwidth about stressing about stuff totally changes. I don't know if think, that answers what you're saying. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, like, like he was saying, Oakland is a pretty crazy place. Uh, you know, I've, I've traveled. I've been blessed to be able to travel all around, not only just the country, but to a lot of different countries. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was actually thinking this morning, like, the blaring poverty uh, and homelessness in, like, straight-up towns, I guess, mm-hmm. of, of tents with trash all around it and people who are literally suffering so hard is more in your face in Oakland, LA, SF, Seattle than it is in Ecuador, which mm. is a, which is a third world country um, and not even close to seen as one of the powers of the of the modern world whereas America is seen as one of the fuck powers of the modern mm. world um, it's so in your face here and it's honestly like, it's it's just it's just pretty crazy. Like maybe because you live here or the people who live here, you see it every day becomes part of the environment. So although you still conscientize like how crazy it is, it might seem less and less crazy even just just by a small percentage every day. Mm-hmm. Whereas to someone who like doesn't really see that shit ever, because we see it in New York, but not not you know not like this. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes me think w- with uh, raising a child here, like if that becomes an actual worry. Mm. Or, or not really because we recently spoke to someone and they were saying how this is the this is part of life and I don't want them to be sheltered it's about mm. just understanding where we stand in the grand scheme of things and and just that's something that shouldn't be I guess hidden from view what do you what's your uh, stance on that um I mean there's a bunch of questions or things to say um yeah I think not sheltering your child is important. Finding a balance between telling them about the world so that they're not naive, but not destroying their sense of security or, or their wonder in the world. You know, I don't want to overwhelm them with, with uh, the, the pains and, and inequity that is, yeah, like you're saying, everywhere you look, um, pretty much throughout the world, um, that's a hard balance to strike. Um, when my kids ask me, you know, oh, is that person homeless? You know, I try to answer them and I try to explain it in a way that makes sense to them. Um, I don't think it's like, I don't think you should hide that stuff away. Obviously, that's a part of the world that that everyone needs to come to terms with and figure out what they can do to make a better change. Um, uh I forgot what was the second part. Oh, oh, I think, yeah. I mean, I think the poverty here in the Bay is pretty pronounced. Um, 
you know, the ho- there's a there's a crazy housing crisis. Uh, it's super expensive to live here, and then there's also a lot of very wealthy people. So the wealth gap is huge, and it's very pronounced here in a in a way that is sort of unique that I haven't seen elsewhere in the states. Like you'll see people that are very wealthy walking past total desolation and just just yeah poverty people living on the streets right in downtown san francisco or right in oakland um you see those things mixed together in a way where usually they're separated and and pushed off to the side um and yeah i feel like that's just the fact of where we're at in with sort of capitalism not working um but i don't i don't I think there's a lot of positive things about the Bay Area as well, you know, and and so there's a balance to be struck with sort of like focusing your energy on or, or paying attention to. Um, you, yeah, I guess you get to choose what you pay attention to, right? Mm-hmm. So if you focus on negativity and crime and and poverty and um, inequity, then you tend to see more of that and vice versa if you're trying to do good things or be positive or create more beauty in the world or be fair uh kind or gentle with people then that's what you spend your time thinking about so i guess i try to spend my time doing the positive stuff Mm -hmm. um but i don't i don't i'm not trying to like lie to myself about what's going on here yeah Um, i just don't know what to do about it you know yeah How, how does oakland uh mix with your your current job which is painting yeah i mean most of the projects that i've been working on are in san francisco right now but um yeah i'm out and about painting in oakland um i guess i don't know what you mean how does oakland mix like Like, is it a place that has yeah i mean is it a place that has a lot of opportunity for painting um Mm. not necessarily legal graph but i mean like in terms of your actual work Mm, and yeah, yeah. is it is that why or one of the reasons that you live here because it facilitates it yeah i think i think the bay area has is is pretty ripe with opportunity for large-scale murals and things like that which is what i do for work um that's that's there's like a long history with that um and that's something that you know people are looking for um so there's ample wall space um, so yeah, living in the East Bay, my decision to live in the East Bay is largely based on that happening here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are you still actively, uh, painting graph, um, illegally? Do you paint streets in Oakland? Like, uh, what's the deal with that? Yeah, I get out, I paint a little bit. Um, I think I'm getting back into running around and doing spots and things like that. I took a bit of a break. Uh, where I didn't take a break from painting just all the way, but, um, there was a time where I was painting a lot more when you have kids, like you just, what are you going to do? You can't get out as much. Um, but now I feel like, yeah, a bit more connected to it, living closer, living right in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. Um, which is another reason why I wanted to move back here. Mm -hmm. So taking it a little back to, um, you know, not the roots, but maybe just you coming up with the name that you have and uh, just even your style, because when I look at your graffiti, I see like a certain standard you set, you know, it's like a high standard because like, you know, there, there's pieces and there's like real pieces and real can control and color contrast and just, you know, like when you look at your graffiti, um, you can see a high standard that you set. Um, how did you develop like your style and like who kind of taught you what you know in terms of putting letters together colors together just everything like how did that come about like that um you know that style essentially Mm. I mean I think I've been fortunate to be around a lot of people that that I ended up taking things from or being influenced by or not taking things from but taking away from those relationships um skills that they had or some ideas that they were putting me on to. So I, I would say, like anyone, you know, you're a mix of all your influences plus your interests. Um, and the people that I've been around, I've been super fortunate to be around people who are generous and talented. And uh, 
I'd say, I guess I'm just a mix. I'm like an amalgam of all those experiences. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I was able to like, like we were talking about earlier, the guys in YME, uh, my boy learn put me on to a bunch of stuff involved with freight graffiti and, and, and the history of that stuff. Um, and sort of showed me the ropes around, you know, how to paint freights or what was going on with that scene. Um, and then, you know, people that my, my friends and my crewmates are, are my biggest influences. Mm -hmm. Um, and then of course, traveling, you know, seeing different stuff, um, just getting exposed to like, you know, different stuff that's happening, um, has been probably the biggest impact on me developing my style or yeah working on my working on my stuff mm. yeah because who you have in your crew and who puts you on is like super important to the foundation mm -hmm. of who you are as a writer because when you go to new york you can see like a lot of the younger kids coming up um they don't really have mentors let's say like with graffiti and you can mm -hmm. see it reflect on the walls you know what i mean and someone can be doing the same thing for like six years and you can see that they don't really have a true mentor that will sit them down and teach them styles and letters and books and uh, it's it's really sick when you see someone um, at your level because you can see that they do have a good team behind them and that they have like a solid foundation what to go off of and they can only take it from there you mm -hmm. know what I mean so yeah yeah I think when you know you don't want to whack out when you're painting with with other people and when they set the bar high you know you need to kind of bring it um, and I've been fortunate to just be around people that were more talented than me and looking at what they're doing and being like, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, and trying to figure out what's going on by watching what I'm surrounded with. Um, yeah, I feel definitely proud to be a part of the group of people that I am, the crews that I'm in. Mm -hmm. Um, and those are, those, those guys sort of keep me inspired and keep me interested in painting and, you know, just keep it moving. Why do you focus on freights as opposed to the streets? I think I used to paint a lot more freights. I haven't as much here. Um, when I when I grew up in Maine, I was painting freights because that was what was around. Um, and it was also cool just to see all the regional styles that were being painted on them. Um, back then, there was a lot. There was there was more regional styles happening. And so you could kind of see from different freights from different parts of the country, um, the different local scenes and the, and the letter styles. Um, since moving to California, I've painted way less freights just because there's a lot more stuff to paint. And there's, excuse me, there's a lot more um, wall space uh, and there's a lot less freights. I think there's, there's a lot of freights here, but it's super competitive. And also, uh, a lot of the spots are like out in the middle of nowhere, or there's more security. Um, so, yeah, in probably the last ten years, I painted a lot less than the first ten or so. Mm -hmm. What do you think the biggest differences are that you see between freight graph versus street graph? Because I honestly feel like they're two pretty separate things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a lo everything about them, even like the style of person, I think mm -hmm. that uh, gravitates to one or the other. It's like pretty different. Yeah, I I mean, freights are definitely more of a mission. You gotta gotta plan stuff. Um, a lot of people that are into freights, or I guess like not, a, I don't know what the numbers are, but it seems like a lot of people that are into freights are also into the history of freight trains and how their involvement in the development of the country and and how different areas of the country sort of um, grew up and the industries that happened around them because freights are such an integral part of that. So people tend to be like, you know, a little more like history buffs or mm -hmm. knowing about that kind of like geography, business, um, that kind of stuff. Uh, I think streets is like more, maybe more, you know, just like more adrenaline and energy. Um, anything could happen. So it's a little bit of, they're, like you're saying, they're different scenes. They, they sort of draw different crowds to them. Um, yeah, yeah. I as far as the style goes, I mean, I think 
you can spend more time usually painting a freight than you can on the street. So people who paint freights tend to develop their style more and it's less like bombing. Um, yeah, I don't know, but there's such weird, there's such weird people involved in just a mix of people involved in both. Um, I don't know if you can make like a generalization about either. Yeah. What's up with uh with Oakland and graffiti? Because like I mentioned, it was it's my first time here, and I think we speak for both of us. Our first time in Oakland, and you know it's pretty bombed, honestly. Like on the highways, and there's like yeah, some pretty smashed. pretty crazy stuff going on. Like uh, I and honestly, I haven't really seen any cops around. So like, what is it yeah. like painting over here? And like, uh, what's up with the law and like just Oakland graffiti in general? Yeah, I, I think I mean it's 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 smashed here right now. There's there's not a big buff. Um, you know, with the pandemic everywhere got smashed and there's a lot less budget here to, that's been allocated to remove graffiti. And part of the reason is there's a lot more crime. And so I think there's been, you know, reprioritizing of resources and police. And also there's been a federal injunction here for a long time with cops. I mean, it's a lot of mix of things like cops are more reluctant to respond to low priority crime. And I think that here in Oakland specifically, there's, there's a, they have like a policy where they're not going to come unless there's like an active violent crime. Like I'm pretty sure if you call 911, they, they just send you to like a recording or not 911. Sorry. If you call the Oakland police department, Mm -hmm. they send you to like a recording and they tell you to like report it online unless there's like some violent crime happening. So Um, they only respond to violent crime? I don't, I don't, I'm pretty sure that's the policy. I don't think that they're going to go out for a graffiti case um, unless there's something violent happening. So yeah, so the cops here, like they're not, there's there's just way bigger stuff to, to worry about, which I think contributes to more and more graffiti. So it's good graffiti, good for graffiti. Maybe bad for, bad for society. society. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> After, uh, I, I feel like that's just one positive thing, but in in the broader scheme of things, maybe not such a positive thing. Yeah, like after this episode, all the writers in America are going to come here. Well, that's already <laughs> happened. Like when I moved here in 2006, there was very little street graffiti, and also just Oakland was totally different. It was sort of dead at night. Like. There was like a nine to five crowd downtown. There wasn't as, as many like hip little bars or restaurants. And there was a small community of writers that were painting here that were from, from an outside perspective. That's how it seemed to me. Of course, there's a rich history of graffiti here, um, you know, that goes back decades. Um, but at the time when I moved here, there wasn't a lot of street graffiti. There was just a small group of people. Um, and since then, since I moved here, lots more people have moved here and and begun to paint here. Um, and it feels like people move here to do graffiti. Like, I think a lot of people have moved here being like, oh, it's easy to paint here. It's kind of like an easy get over. Um, because and that, it truly is smashed. Yeah, it's smashed. It's destroyed. People are just painting pieces on the street. But I feel like everywhere in the States now, like there's a lot more street yeah. graffiti and there's a lot more pieces on the street, even in New York City, which is typically like hard to get over. Mm. There's a lot more unmarked cops. They cops know what's going on in New York. Mm. You know, they're up on stuff and there's still pieces being painted on the street, like full color pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's maybe it's just a different time. There's more people writing and people are just emboldened mm-hmm. to do crazier stuff now. Mm-hmm. Right. Like once I feel like too, like once something starts to get normalized, it's harder and harder for like city residents or businesses to be like, what, we got to get rid of all this stuff when there's like so much of it already, you know, it just becomes a new normal. So unless the city just removes it all and sort of like hits Mm -hmm. the reset button, graffiti is just much more a part of city life nowadays than maybe it was like 10 years ago, but maybe it won't always be like that, but it feels like that's sort of where Mm -hmm. we're headed. Um, which, you know, it's cool to see like the youth are alive and, mm-hmm. and well, and, and busy in the streets and yeah. yeah. It just seems like, uh, you know, as most parts of LA, sometimes you don't even have to look out for cops. That's not the problem. You have to mm-hmm. look out for like gangs or people that, you know, are let's say, essentially crawling around at night, you know, mm-hmm. like looking for trouble. So, uh, is that, do you feel like that's the case here? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think 
the problems you're going to have on the streets at night in Oakland are not going to be usually from cops. There's, because if you're out at two in the morning up to no good, what do you think the person yeah. next to you is doing? They're not, you know, they're not tending to their garden. So they're also going to be doing some sort of thing that they they're, don't want to be doing in the daytime. Um, and those are ten, tend to be the people that you're going to have problems with. But I mean, there isn't, a, there isn't really a gang problem here and, and you don't, I don't think you need to think about that as much as certainly in LA. Um, but there's plenty of like, you know, it gets wild if you spent, have you been here at night yeah, in we, Oakland? We, um, inside the motel, inside yeah. the motel, we, uh, you downloaded, hear gunshots we downloaded it's this, wild. the citizens app just for kind of enter, not entertainment purposes, but like just to see, <laughs> just to see, what just to see what's going Get on. Get a little litmus test <laughs> and, of what's uh, happening. Yeah, there was definitely, uh, yeah, there was definitely stuff going on. Yeah. There. I mean, <laughs> <if you> think <laughs> about it, like there's most, most shit's not being reported, you know? Like they have those shot callers here. Do they have those in New York? The little triangulating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they have that all throughout Oakland because no one's going to call the cops when the when people start shooting. Um, so I mean, but that's been like that for a long time. Painting and hearing gunshots or seeing people shooting or being shot at uh, is part of painting here and has been. Like I've been shot at. And You've been shot at while painting here. Yeah, yeah, um, numerous times. Hmm. Um, but I don't know. That's just how it goes. Well, I guess. they just drive by and they're like, "Fuck you!" and they shoot just in your general area, or is there purpose yeah. to kill? I mean, it didn't feel like I was being chased down by someone trying to kill me, but yeah, I mean, um, it's just people rolling around, wilding out. Um, yeah. I remember one time I was painting this track side uh, in East Oakland and all this shooting started happening and all the dirt like at the end of the wall was like flying up in the air. The rocks were going everywhere. And I was with this younger kid and he was like, yo, we got to go. We got to go. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't think they're shooting at us. They're just like shooting right there. And there was a club at the end of the wall, like a nightclub. And I think, I think the person was just like, I imagine they're just like showing their friends this new gun they got or whatever. Just, I don't know, just whatever, letting off steam. Um, and I thought, okay, yeah, maybe we got to duck out for a minute cause the cops will come. And so we kind of like stepped back and waited, but no one came, you know, it's just like whatever, another, another weekend night. Um, yeah, that's, that stuff's kind of normal. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, like, what are the repercussions or consequences of getting caught for graffiti in Oakland, do you know? Well, they used to be more serious. Um, but I think, I, I don't know, like, nowadays, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what's going on with that. I, I haven't been caught in a while. Um, I think it's different where, you know, in Southern California, it's different than here. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you could, like anywhere, you're going to get it's going to get worse the more cases you have. So I think most of the time though, now like you can, you could duck out or they might let you go. They might take your paint. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you've got to like do a bunch of dirt to have some major consequences. Yeah. Cause New York has, I don't know what it is. Like it's, it's kind of give or take. Sometimes a graffiti case can have more consequences than someone stabbing someone or like someone raping someone on the mm. subway. Like it's it's pretty crazy how that works or how they decide those certain cases, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think that what they used to have like the statutes around how they sent it stuff, and I don't know. Like, I feel like violent crimes are always going to be prosecuted more than more than graffiti. I don't know how it works in different states, but yeah, it does seem like in general the consequences for writing graffiti are not in line with the act. You know, there's yeah. like crazy court fines or jail time or whatever and it's just you can just go paint the wall out like it's you know you're not changing the course of anyone's life by doing graffiti other than the consequences of the writer themselves if they get bagged do you have any uh aims for the future in terms of your your art your fine art and just painting outside of graffiti yeah i mean i mean i think that um of course i'm always trying to to do something interesting or what I've, what I've been trying to do recently is bring the, bring 
graffiti and painting large scale murals sort of together um, and paint stuff that that is uh, drawing from my history and and my involvement in graffiti but that doesn't necessarily look like a graffiti piece but sort of uses like um, some of the same aesthetics so it's maybe it's a little more abstracted um, but it still uses like letters as the basis so I've been trying to develop that aesthetic a little bit more um, I've done a bunch of walls around the Bay Area that that uh, that are sort of like working on that um, and yeah I'd like to I like to continue to do that and just paint bigger bigger stuff like with the commercial work that I'm doing we've been painting a lot of large-scale buildings with these swing stages and a lot of it is more dictated by um, what the client wants and so they have a lot more say in saying oh you know change this color put our not our logo necessarily but they'll say can we use these colors or you know they'll just have a lot more they'll be in the driver's seat more with sort of like influencing the aesthetic you know uh, we'll bring our ideas and then there will be sort of a back and forth but I'd love to get to the point where I'm doing large-scale murals like you know 8 10 12 story but it's just my stuff and people are saying hey you know we want you to do what you do without us dictating or art directing um, what's happening but I think I feel like I have to work up to that and in a way, working on these commercial projects is a good way to build up that because I get to develop the skills around how to accomplish such a large scale thing that takes a lot of planning or figuring out how long it takes to paint certain size things. Um, and it's sort of like practice almost to work towards that. Before we um, started this episode, you showed like a uh this wall you're working with yeah. uh, currently where you're using like essentially like a hanging scaffold. Mm -hmm. So my question with that is, since it's such a tall story building, do you, how often do you like take a step back and look at the overall, you know, piece, how it's coming out? Or are you so used to kind of working so upfront and you know, you know, how it's going to look essentially? Mm, yeah. I mean, we, we, we step back, we look at it. It's hard to see when you're working on such a big, like, you're saying this eight story wall that we're doing, it's hard to see from three feet away whether the, the blend is big enough or, or the line, the arc of the line is right. Um, but um, yeah, we tend to take some breaks like maybe a couple times a day and go step back and see how it's looking. But for the most part, I'm just up there with my buddy and just listening to music and, and just having a good time. Um, yeah. So so we lay out the sketch, we have like, we have our, our plan that we're looking at um, and, and a whole section that we're working on. And then we'll, we'll step back from time to time and take a look and like make adjustments or, or move on to the next thing. When you're, uh, when you're on those scaffolds painting these murals, do you ever think back to, you know, being a scientist and do you ever think like, where would I, like, I would be literally in a different environment doing something essentially so different right now for financial gain? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think about it from time to time. I miss thinking, like I was saying earlier, I miss thinking critically in that kind of a way. Um, the biggest difference that I find that, that is nice about painting or creating, doing something creative versus doing the science is like with science, this, the scale, or I'd say the time frame for what you're working on is way different. You have to plan out your research project, plan out your question, design a way to accomplish it or look at the question. And then you need to move all the way through that process before you make adjustments. So say your research project is going to take six weeks, right? And on week one, you're like, Oh, I don't think this is going well. You still have five more weeks of like carrying out what you planned with, with all those steps of going in every single day and, um, culturing the cells or testing, you know, running experiments versus painting, you're painting something. You're like, I don't think that's the right blue. You just mix a new blue or you add a little more green or you can make that instantaneous. Or if you're like, you know what? I don't think we should use blue there. Let's use red. That will look cool. You can adapt and be creative and respond to the moment in a much shorter, more intuitive way. It feels like the time scale is much different 
thinking critically as an artist versus thinking critically as a scientist. And that's more me, like that fits my personality more to respond to the moment and make that decision rather than be like, write it down in my notebook and go back a month later and make the little adjustment to the next experiment. Um, so I guess that's what I think about. I'm, I'm, I'm often like, I can't believe I get to do this. I get to work with my friends, do something huge that's fun and challenging. And many people, you know, like constantly throughout the day, people are like, wow, that's so beautiful. That's crazy. The other day, this dude walked by, he said, you're living the dream. And I was like, yeah, I feel like I am, man. Thank you. I don't know if he was joking around, but you know, it <laughs> felt like, yeah, it was nice. I think it's a uh, pretty interesting how like, for example, science is kind of like a hard line thing. Like you're going to measure this thing or you're going to figure out this thing and the purposes for it to work in the end or whatever your aims may be. There's a clear and cut definition of like right and wrong and like success. Mm -hmm. You're going to see if it worked or not. And you're also like, like the scientific method is based upon like experimentation and, and uh, re I forget the word, but like repeatable results that mm -hmm. someone yeah, else can yeah. do the same shit you've shown. Uh, you make a high pop and like, you're basically running off the assumption that like literally the whole shit might be wrong. And then in the end, if it's wrong, you just start over until you, till you find the answer as opposed to uh, painting where there's like, it's pretty open-ended and open to interpretation. Like mm -hmm. I can't actually say that this painting is, is real deal art versus uh, that painting isn't real deal art. Um, it's super open to interpretation. There's no real right or wrong um, uh, yeah. in a broad sense. And it's just kind of interesting how you were, into both of them to a pretty high level. Like you're uh, actually working as a research scientist versus actually working as a painter. It's like kind of night and day, you know? So I can see why you would say the thinking critically aspect. Uh, although like, do you not have anything else that forces you to critically think in that way? Or is like stem cell such a rowdy form of critical thinking that you can't just replicate it with anything? Mm, I'm not sure I fully understand your your last, your last part of that question, like, um, what do you mean? Do not 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 have anything else? It's like, do you have anything else that makes you that reminds you of the critical thinking style of uh, thinking mm. that stem cell research biology did for you? No, I mean, I feel like, yeah, I I think they are pretty different. Um, I think that, uh, I think that 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 being an artist, being a painter and being a scientist are very different. Um, I don't do anything nowadays that, that is similar in the same type of way as I did when I was doing research science. Um, I think some of the approach that I take to making art draws on the same interest in all the details, like these, these paper cutouts that I have behind you. Um, just working at that scale or maybe working with some of the same tools, like I'll be working with a scalpel, um, you know, I was using that from time to time in, in my science work. Um, so I think those things, there's some parallels in terms of like the granularity of stuff. Um, so I guess, I guess that's the, that's the overlap that I still have, or, or that's the itch that I get to satisfy with, with, uh with my art stuff is like creating some sort of like highly detailed or uh yeah yeah or thinking critically of, i guess about a process of layering and using different techniques um to come up with a different aesthetic is another way to to sort of use the same set of brain skills you know mm -hmm. broadly but yeah, um, we, we were going to, like I said, we were going to wrap it up. I was going to say uh, thank you for coming yeah. on the show and, you know, telling us about your story and speaking openly about your job, your yeah, past yeah. job as a scientist. Um, really appreciate it and really enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. Just yeah. like you said, uh, it's been a pleasure being out here and seeing your space. And uh, it it's provides a lot of motivation, honestly, mm -hmm. you, you doing Thanks. this. And yeah. Um, I wish you the best. I hope you don't get shot at anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, um, I yeah, wish you the you best. Know, what yeah. can you do? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Mm -hmm. right, peace. Peace, man. Yeah.